That's not, there probably must, are. There must be. be. It seems like it because <laughs> when we're in trial, there are only five of exactly. them. Exactly. One of us. Yeah. Um, we've got you know staff and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I think there are more of them. I have no empirical evidence of that, but it seems to me there are a lot of them out there. <laughs> all these buildings are full of them. Aren't it's they? right. Yeah. Probably <laughs> full of them everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the defense bar. They've got the, a lot more at their disposal. You know, when insurance company says, go fight, it's a blank check, right? We don't care, go in, conquer. And when we go in, you know, costs matter to our clients. So we gotta, you know, we have to be smart about it. We don't take, we don't have 10 attorneys go try a, you know, a rear end collision case. We don't do that, it's not, it's not how it works, so. And is it true that plaintiff's lawyers make more money than defense lawyers? I, I don't know that to be, a, I, I don't know. I think that uh, with medium to, to small to medium sized defense firms, in, we're talking insurance defense firms, there is um, sort of a scale and they will necessarily, young associates will start out at a higher pay rate than a first year associate in a plaintiff's firm, but at a certain point unless a person makes a partner in a defense firm, you're gonna top out, whereas in a plaintiff's firm, you often don't have that limitation, okay? But the flip side of that is on the plaintiff side, you don't have a lot of uh, as many partnership opportunities as you would on the defense side, but certainly a plaintiff's work at the end of the day can can be very lucrative. Yep. So as far as um, let's say that hypothetically you don't you you're not one of those lucky four that gets published. Mm -hmm. Are there other opportunities that the organization offer? I mean, and is it limited to? I mean, how big is? The scope of the firms or an organization is as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Well, we have a, the law student internship placements as well. So what happens is our firm members, you know, if there's someone looking for a summer clerk, they'll call the SFTLA office and say, "I need a clerk. I need two clerks. Whatever it is, here's the type of law." And if you, as a law student, have filled out one of our questionnaires and become a member, your information is in there, and we can match you up with firms. So that's one way that we uh, can help you find jobs for the summer, and also during the year, because a lot of our members don't just need summer clerks, we need help all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so if any of you third years have kind of a light caseload, or even second years, uh, that's a great opportunity. The other way is, you know, if you're a member, you get to be on our listserv, and that's where a lot of people are like, I'm slammed, I need a law clerk right now, who do you know? And if you've met this person at a cocktail party, if you've met someone else, you said, you know, who knows you, that's how you get jobs in our community. So, and we've had lots of lawsuits from Golden Gate be very persistent, come to our events and make contacts. Um, so I think it's a really, that's the real way you're gonna get a job. But also, the, through the interview process, because we interview so many people, um, the people we reject are often fantastic and, and just would be snatched up in a second. So we, the, those people are on our radar, those of us who have interviewed them, um, and we spread the word. So when people look for law work, we say, hey, you know, Number five didn't make it, but this is a great person for you. Right, and we interview a lot of candidates, and we, we our interview process is usually there's, about, I don't know, six, nine of us interviewing in a rotation, so you have an opportunity to meet uh, a lot of lawyers just during the interview process. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah. Um, how difficult is it to switch from plaintiff side to defense side or the other way? You would never switch from plaintiffs to defense. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. I don't know anybody who's done that. But I have lots of friends who have done what I've done, started with defense and gone to plaintiffs. I don't know anybody who's gone the other way. Um, it's would not, you even get hired going the other way? Can you get hired? The I other mean, would, would, the, would the firms look at you and just laugh and say we don't want I don't, I don't like know. It depends on your experience. Um, I, I, I haven't seen it happen. I think People who make this transition, they, they make it, you know, for, for a reason. Uh, to go the other way, it's not that difficult. It's, it's a different, doing defense work really helps you understand how, you know, from my perspective, how insurance companies and defense attorneys think about cases, right? How they pay money, what claims they think are valid, how, what arguments they're receptive to, which they, what arguments they reject out of hand. And so for me to make the transition, uh, all I had to understand was that was I was doing the same work, but on the other side. And you have to get your head around that. And for me, it wasn't that difficult. I had a little bit of help because the defense firm I was at, 
uh, they would, and this happened to a lot of defense firms, you know, they would take plaintiff's cases, the aunt, of the adjuster, sister, whatever, hurt herself and needed representation, so we would start taking those cases, and they knew that that was my interest, so they would give me those cases, so I got to sort of ease into the process, but the one difficult thing for me was, even though on the defense side we had to bill, right, I had to like bill 1,900 hours a year, which is like 160 hours a month, and you have to keep track of every second of your time, and I felt like I was working all the time with a young defense lawyer. When I got to the plaintiff side, I realized that to do plaintiff's work, you have to be really efficient, which is something you don't have to be on the defense side, because on the defense side, you're just sort of deflecting, you're like, you know, you're sort of responding to things. On the plaintiff side, you have to actually keep cases moving forward at a steady pace, uh, because otherwise the defense won't do anything at all and your case will sit there stagnant. So I did have to learn how to be very, very efficient with my time. Uh, and I, I realize now that if I had to go back to defense work, I think I could probably do the work I did then, you know, in, in half time. <laughs> so that was the, the one hard part. And you also have to kind of take the governor off a little bit and be more, become comfortable with risk. Okay, because on the plaintiff side, if you recommend your client a settlement offer is not acceptable and you go to trial and you're wrong, there are repercussions for that. But you can't be uh, scared, so scared that you never make any decisions or always take the safe route because that's not how, uh, how it works. You know, to get the best result with your, for your client, sometimes you have to do things and make decisions that are hard. Anybody else? One more question. Yeah. Um, with the, the cutbacks coming down the line for civil courts, who, which side is, is they're going to give an advantage to one side or the other? Will they um, be more likely to settle knowing that it's going to be years, or are you guys going to be more likely to settle because it'll be longer to get into court? Well, we've had some good news that the cutbacks are not going to be anywhere near as severe as originally thought. So uh, there, there is some money coming from other sources, so the San Francisco Superior Court is uh, only going to close uh, half the number of courtrooms and the layoffs are going to be much more, uh, less drastic than thought. Uh, I don't think, and I've talked about this with a lot of defense attorneys, and as far as the insurance industry is concerned, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really help or hurt one side or the other exactly. Uh, it, it hurts the access to justice in one sense that if it's harder to get a trial, a courtroom, it's harder to get matters resolved and harder to, to put, have your clients put their cases behind them. But in the insurance industry anyway, the insurance companies can't keep cases open indefinitely because they have reporting requirements and audit requirements and they have to report to shareholders and, and so on and so forth. So they can't delay uh, the way you might think they can. For other cases, like employment cases where you don't have insurance companies on the other side, you know, that might be a tactic. But generally speaking, both sides understand that cases have to move along anyway. And there's some talk that it actually might encourage parties that might otherwise sit down and try to mediate or resolve disputes to actually do that. Uh, it also might encourage folks to start doing uh, other sorts of binding arbitrations, agreement on both sides or be creative about, about resolving cases. Anybody else? Any more questions? Yeah? Um, I'm sorry, that one of those is also going to be out there today. <clears throat> was more just it is in criminal, for example? So sure. That, those extra things that you're seeking about the opportunities to build? We have a number of criminal defense lawyers in our membership. Uh, we have uh, Shannon Dugan has actually been a criminal defense lawyer for a long, long time. She's a member of our board. Uh, and criminal defense is a great way, you know, criminal law in, in any way, it's a great way to get trial experience on both sides because you, you try way more cases in criminal than you do in civil. So that could be you know, invaluable. invaluable. So if you're interested in making contact, certainly contact us and put you with criminal defense lawyers. Anybody else? The time? Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.